day, this is election day, um, and I'm not sure how you're feeling about it. You may be just feeling completely fine, but no matter what, we did want to spend this time together um, looking at art and primary sources, but also uh, we want to look at the people who really made a difference um, in our history and how that can inform our future. So we're really excited that you're joining us on this very special day. Um, before we get started, I did want to acknowledge that we're focusing on Black and African American women um, during the Civil Rights Movement. And as a white woman, I acknowledge my privilege and my perspective as we dive into this work. Lisa and I are here to discuss strategies for talking about children's book illustrations and primary sources and elevate parts of history that may have been hidden over the years. Um, I didn't introduce you, Lisa. Do you want to jump in? No worries. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you all. Um, my name is Lisa Landers, and I am the Education Coordinator at the Georgia Historical Society. Um, and um, like Kate said, it is um, a great day. We are super excited about this program. We think that um, we hope that you will enjoy it. And um, we'll look forward to, um, you know, answering any questions you have toward the end. Great. This is our first time collaborating together and we're pretty excited about it. Um, so before we get started, I did want to sort of frame this whole presentation by saying that I will be talking about the children's book illustrations that are now on view at the High Museum in the exhibition called Picture the Dream, the story of the civil rights movement through children's books. Uh, it features over 90 works of original works of art. Um, it's a completely beautiful exhibition and fortunately it ends this Sunday. So if you wanna see it and if you're in the area, I strongly encourage you to check it out as soon as you can. Um, we're gonna, in this exhibition, it looks at um, 40 different illustrators too. So they're telling the story of the civil rights movement, what led up to the movement, uh, what happened during it and where it is today. Um, so it's a really incredible exhibition and we're gonna use that work to frame how to talk about primary sources within the classroom. The exhibition, uh, and there's also a virtual tour available on our website, it's divided into three different sections. The first is called A Backward Path uh, that looks at everything that, that led up to the civil rights movement, the Jim Crow South, what that was like um, for Black and African American people living during that time. Then a section called The Rocks or the Road, um, which is what were the events that were happening during the civil rights movement? Who were the key players and figures? And then the last section is called Today's Journey, Tomorrow's Promise. So where is the civil rights movement today and how, how can students, especially young people, make a difference today? How can they be um, activists within their own right? Uh, this exhibition was curated by Andrea Pinckney, who is an editor at Scholastic, but she's also a writer and illustrator herself. Um, I skipped over it really quickly, but just wanted to say that if you go to our website, you can see that there's an incredible teacher resource kit, as well as a family discussion guide about talking about um, the civil rights movement with young people. Um, these are some images of the exhibition. Um, just in case you're not able to see it, here are some just quick snapshots. It really is a beautiful show, and we hope that you can either see it or see the virtual field trip that's available for free on our website. Um, it includes a video that was done by um, Pearl Clegg, who's a playwright in residence at the Alliance Theater, and she's joined in conversation with Andrea Pinckney. This video is also available on our website. Um, and then at the very end, there's a reading nook section um, where you can look at all of the books that are featured within the exhibition and there's a list of books that are on um, our website as well. And yes, unfortunately, this exhibition ends on Sunday, November 8th. So I'm going to look at just a handful of works of art that feature women within the civil rights movement. Um, and I'm going to be using the strategy called visual thinking strategies. Many of you are probably familiar with this already, 
um, it's a very student-centered strategy that helps students unpack a work of art um, and really gets them to feel empowered when they're um, looking at images. This can be done with a work of art or with any, any image whatsoever. I've done this with maps. Um, I've done this with more than just illustrations or paintings. Um, what's really incredible about it is that it will fit really nicely into what Lisa will talk about during her section. Um, this is really the observation piece of diving more deeply into a work of art. It's basically three questions. What is going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And what more can we find? I wanted to show you a few works of art that's in the exhibition, and then we're going to try out those visual thinking strategies together. Um, what I love about this show is that it really dives deep into topics that you don't normally see within children's books. Um, so we see Ruby Bridges at a very young age and what her day to day life was like as she um, was desegregating. She was the, the youngest child. Um, in the South to desegregate a school, elementary school. Um, but then we also see images by, like this one is of Kadir Nelson's illustration of Coretta Scott King. Um, it, the book was written in 2009. His work, if you're unfamiliar with Kadir Nelson, he's an incredible illustrator. His work is really very beautiful. Um, and this is a beautiful painting to see in person. So the ones we're going to focus on are our hidden figure women. Um, this was for a book called Hidden Figures, um, the true story of four black women in the space race. It was done in 2018. Um, the illustrator and the writer was Laura Freeman. So this is, this is the part that we kind of want you to be interactive in. So either um, if you want to answer in the chat or take yourself off mute, we would love to hear your responses. And we're just going to go through those strategies really uh, briefly. So I want you all to take a minute to look at this work of art. What we tell students is to look from corner to corner, from top to bottom, um, from sideways to sideways, just to examine every aspect about this, this work of art that you can. So I'll go ahead and ask that first painting, or I'm sorry, that first question. What do you see in this picture? What is going on in this picture? So if anybody wants to just add in the chat box or if they want to um, take themselves off mute. Matt, <laughs> I see. Happening. Great, so you see math in the fabric of the clothes. We see four women looking into space or four women of color looking up. Each woman has um, like different planet earrings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of the earrings are of planets or stars, uh, maybe some moons in there. I see satisfaction on their faces because they're smiling. Great. Let me pick on you for a second, if you don't mind. Um, so you said you see satisfaction on their face and somebody else wrote that in the comments too. They're all smiling. Um, tell me more about satisfaction. What do you see that makes you say satisfaction? Because the smile isn't a beam. It's a, it's a, it's like, I know it's like a, a knowing smile. Yeah, I love that. It's a knowing smile. It's not just uh, smiling for a camera. It's as if there's some sort of hope or there's something that is showing um, that they know something. I, I think that same thing is reflected in their eyes. Yes. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just the smile. We also see it in their eyes. Uh -huh. uh, maybe even more of the facial expression of the way that uh, their chins are lifted a little bit. 
I also noticed they all seem to be um, older because their hair color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're looking at older women. Their hair color is all of um, different shades of gray. It's a good inference. Um, I'm going to pick on Miss Fadina for a second too, because she's also my friend. Uh, could you tell us why you said achievement? Well, um, we all know they accomplished something pretty major, and it's just that feeling that just looking at their eyes and their smile, it's just a look of achievement um, a person would have after going through so much to um, actually accomplish, um, you know, anything that um, they had trials or um, um, challenges to go through just to attain it. Great, thank you. So you're bringing some of your background knowledge about um, who these women are to know that they have um, established some sort of achievement within their lives. But we can also sort of feel that within the confidence of how they're standing and looking. Um, I feel achievement, even if I didn't know um, the history behind them. You can definitely see it. And someone asked if we could read our, the comments. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that. There's so many good ones going on. Um, they look content or proud. There is unity, collaboration. All of them are looking in the same direction, the posture. Uh, they care about details. They are dressed to impress. That's great. Um, dignity, <laughs> grace, and knowledge, and beauty. Um, I want to go back to the comment that was made about the math formulas on their shirts. Uh, somebody had said that, uh, and that's something that I actually didn't notice the first time I looked at this. If you look closely within the fabric, we do see something that it resembles math formulas. Would someone like to talk more about that? I think that was me. My name is Tara. Uh, um, that was just something that I noticed. Um, like I saw the arc on the blue shirt, just kind of the arc of the angel or the ankles, and it just made me think of of you know taking off and the math needed for it. And it, like Molly said, it is really really subtle. Um, but that's immediately what I saw. I was like, hmm, what's this? Is this an art uh, artist signature or is this something else? And when I zoomed in and I saw that it was math, I was like, yeah math and it makes up the fabric of their being and I just like that kind of analogy so that to me was really strong. I love the way you say that that it makes up the fabric of their being. Um, it's not on their necks it's just on their clothes so that that inference that jump is incredible yes and I think did you say it looks as if they're uh, that one arch is as it's taking off is that what I heard you say? Yeah, if you zoom in on the blue um, shirt and I see like two, you know, that are going down, but there's one that's going up to the planet on the earring of the lady with the green shirt. Mm -hmm. And so like just visually, I was like, okay, if you look at all their eyes, they're all going to one spot. If you look at that art, it's going up to that planet. Um, so it just feels like it's all going up to that upper right quadrant. So to me, just visually, it kind of took me there. Are you a math teacher? I am not, I am a social studies teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, she said math quadrant. Um, yeah, that is that is very beautifully put, thank you. So it's, even if we didn't know anything about these people or who they are, there are a lot of inferences that can be made just by looking at the image. Um, so the artist included some very important details within this work of art to tell us who the people are, why they're looking up. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we can continue to unpack this work of art. Um, I'm gonna stop us there with some students, especially young kids. You could go on for an hour just asking these questions of what do you see? What do you see that makes you say that? What more can you see? Uh, but you all did a very good job being students. And I'm gonna pass this on to Lisa so she can talk a little bit more about who we are looking at. Thank you, Kate, and, and that was great. Um, and there are so many details. I really love this illustration. And I'm gonna um, be talking about how we can um, take an illustration like this and really um, 
bring it into the classroom and go beyond what we see here and learn about the time period and learn about who these people are. I'm going to start a little bit. I just want to talk about the Georgia Historical Society, which is um, who I represent. Um, the Georgia Historical Society is a statewide research and education institution. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my slide there. Statewide research and education institution responsible for housing and collecting and maintaining one of the largest collections of Georgia and American history in Georgia. Um, we, the Historical Society itself dates back to 1839, and, and we are located in Savannah, but ultimately we work with students and teachers across the state, um, as in Kate today um, is in Atlanta and I'm down in Savannah. Um, so we're, I'm excited to see that a lot of you are coming from across the, the state and um, uh, excited that you could join us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about a particular strategy um, that really can help students, teachers formulate questions, and then the, with the whole goal of being able to develop the skills to answer those questions. And that's the question formulation technique, or the QFT. And this comes from the Right, Quest, right Question Institute. Um, the Right Question Institute and the Georgia Historical Society are both members of the uh, TP, Teaching with Primary Sources Consortium. If you're not familiar with Teaching with Primary Sources, that is the uh, education arm of the Library of Congress. So this strategy comes from the Right Question Institute and it is an inquiry-based inquiry strategy. And again, helping students to formulate, work with, and then both and answer their own questions. Sorry. So really quickly, I want to talk about why we um, focus on inquiry-based strategies. And that is because it promotes things like critical thinking for students. Um, we're not just, as educators, we're not here just to talk about facts and dates. We're not responsible just for a single narrative version of history. And that's why inquiry-based strategies and historical inquiry are so important um, to when you're, when you're using primary sources in your classroom. So something like this supports the, the development of skills, critical thinking skills, reasoning, being able to find and analyze evidence, and even problem solving. It helps us to look at history as an investigation rather than just a story or a single narrative um, because it, we look at multiple points of view through multiple primary sources. It increases student engagement because they are not only asking their own questions, but they're also working on the skills to be able to find the answers to their own questions. So it's really feeding into their own curiosity. It helps teachers be the experts in what they do, which is help students learn. Rather than being responsible for all the facts and dates that you are responsible for in your standards, um, it helps you take you out of that place and make you a facilitator in learning. And then it also helps students become effective communicators because the whole point here is to answer these questions using evidence that they've found in primary and secondary sources. So building an evidence-based argument. So um, we're going to use the uh, hidden, hidden figures illustration we just looked at as our prompt. When we, um, for the question formulation technique, it always starts with a prompt. And that can be a word or a phrase or a name or an event, um, an artifact, a piece of artwork, a primary source, a photograph. It can be really whatever you want. The other great thing about the QFT is that I have seen this, this strategy utilized in all subject areas. I've seen it used in a math class. You could use it in a science class, in a language class, um, in an art class. Um, so this is a great strategy that is usable um, really with any subject area. So it starts with, again, we talk about the observation. And this is so something that is accessible even to young students because they have the power of observation. And so it's really starting with exactly what Kate talked about. Um, so I like to give students, you know, one, two, maybe three minutes. Um, and during that time, they're going to be following the four rules of the QFT. And that's really integral to this um, practice because they have to follow these rules in order um, to do it right. Um, so you can see that the rules are listed here. One is to ask as many questions as you can in the time allotted, so your one to three minutes of observation. 
You don't want students to stop to discuss questions or judge or even answer the questions. There's no bad questions. We want as many as possible. We want to record their questions exactly as they state them. So in their words, I think that's really important. And then of course, change any statement into a question. So this can be done as a whole group. It can be done as a small group. It can even be done as an individual activity. Want to make sure that you encourage students to number each question as they go along to keep them separate. So I know we've already talked about this illustration, but maybe we'll just take a moment and we will um, see what questions come up for you. So, um, and you can put them in the chat box or, or let us know. Um, but if you were to observe this as we have, what questions come up? Who are they exactly? Excellent. You see a lot of questions here. Who are they? What are they looking at? How old are they? Um, let's see. What accomplishments did they achieve? Did they go to school? Great question. Are they friends? Are they related? Um, why is why are they in space? Or is this space themed? So again. An enormous amount of questions can come up very quickly. Um, and we want to make sure we record these questions, number each one, and again, if there's any statement, we want to change it to a question. You're going to get a lot of questions that are not going to necessarily be something that you want or usable, but that's the whole point of wanting to ask as many questions as possible. So, and we can go to the next slide. We go. So I just went ahead and wrote some down. Um, these are very general, um, but I imagine that students are much more creative and curious, so they would come up with a lot of interesting questions. But for example, here are some. So who are these women? Why are they in space? Do they know each other? Um, then we have, they are looking up. You'll, especially with younger students, potentially get a lot of statements rather than questions. So this is a great learning opportunity for students. Let's change that to a question. Why are they looking up? So this is just a sample of questions, but this is what we want. We want a good list of as many questions as students can come up with. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm able, I'm not able to move forward. Will you, that's okay, but if you'll thank you. Okay, yeah, <laughs> thank just you. let me know. So after we have <clears throat> created our list of questions, Here's where we're going to work on improving questions. And this again is something that is a great learning opportunity for even young students. Um, we want to categorize, the step three is to categorize each question as either open or closed. Open questions are questions that need explanation, something that has to um, be explained to find out the answer. A closed question is something that is answered in only one or two words or maybe like a name or something, or maybe just a yes or a no. I like to have a conversation with students about why does it matter what kind of question it is and why are open questions important and why are closed questions important. Open questions lead to more explanation. They take more time to answer. They're gonna require research. It's not something you can just answer automatically. A closed question is something that maybe you already know the answer to or someone in the room already knows the answer to or something that can be looked up very easily, something that takes less time to answer. So they both have value in their own way. What I have, do, have students do in order to improve their questions is I have them write a, an O next to open questions and a C next to C questions that they've written down. This can lead to some really great discussions in your classroom, whether it's between in their groups or in a whole group, because sometimes there may be a debate on is a question open or closed. So for example, number three, do they know each other? Well, that's probably a yes or a no, right? So we know that yes, they do. Um, but if we want our students working with only open questions, challenge them to change an open, or I'm sorry, a closed question to something that is open. So how can we make that something that is worthy of more explanation? And we might say, how do they know each other? Which is just a simple change. Is it nighttime? Well, yes or no, 
is an easy closed question. Then maybe why is the sky behind them dark, which is more open ended. I prefer to typically prefer students to work with open ended questions because the whole point of the strategy and what I'm talking about today is to do research and to learn and gather evidence, um, which is the whole point of answering an open ended question. But of course, you could also have students work with closed questions based on your own need. I'll go to the next slide. So step four is to prioritize our questions. Now we're gonna choose the questions that we wanna to try to answer. Typically, I have students choose three questions, but you could narrow it down to two or even one. You could have your whole class debate which questions are best out of your whole list. You could try to narrow it down for three for your whole class. In order to narrow down priority questions, we wanna have students think about what they're thinking. So thinking about their own thinking. Things like, why did you ask these questions and why are they important to you? Which questions are most important to you? Which ones do you want to know the answers to? How did you decide the questions that your group came up with? Can you learn from questions that other classmates asked? And this is really a great um, thing to do, and a whole exercise on its own. Thinking about, did you learn anything from the questions that your classmates asked? In fact, uh, Kate, uh, kind of illustrated that for that for us during the um, observation strategy where some of us were like, oh, we didn't notice that. Next part of this, it, after reflecting on your thinking and what you're thinking is to make a plan. Help students, you know, kind of plan out how are they going to answer these questions? Because again, the point is that they are working on the skills to answer their own questions. And these are research skills, critical thinking skills. So what is their plan going to be? We, you may choose to do whatever you want after this point. We're going to look at some primary source sets and that's what's going to be our plan here. Um, but we want to have students thinking about how can they answer their questions? What information do they need in order to answer their questions? Can they respond to any of the priority questions they've chosen already but with the information they have? And then if they don't know the answers to their questions, where can you find that? And that's where we will provide them with a primary source set or primary source exploration. Go to the next slide. So in order to answer our questions, our priority questions, we want to think we, we want students to be able to corroborate evidence through research. And this is where they're going to be, again, analyzing primary sources. Primary sources being those eyewitnesses to history. So just real quick, um, primary sources are things that come from the time period you're studying. So if we're studying women in, in the civil rights movement, we wanna be looking at primary sources from that time period. That is, or a source from that time period, which makes it a primary source. Number one thing that I always teach students is look for your source information. This is your who, what, when, where, why, and how. This is who made it, where did it come from, and when did it come from. These are clues and evidence that can help you answer the questions. I always encourage students, very first thing, look for your source information. You can see that it is here below the image of Mary Johnson. So it tells us who she is, where she is, and what, it, what year it is. It also tells us who produced this photograph, which is NASA. Right there, some of the questions you've asked, what are these women doing? Why is the sky dark? We're starting to see, oh, this might have to do something with space before we've really done any major research. We can see that there is a person here that looks like the person, the, the people, or at least one of the people from the illustration. She's collecting data, which might tell us she's a scientist. You also see, of course, now students might not recognize this giant thing as a computer, <laughs> but it is. Um, and but we can see that there are some knobs and some levers and you know at least they can start to put piece some of that together. So that's where we're looking at that visible evidence and that's that observation step. On a side note, we'll go to the next slide. If you've never done primary source analysis with students, I suggest starting with the primary source analysis tool from the Library of Congress. This is a very simple tool. You can download this worksheet. They can fill it out online. You don't even have to have the worksheet. But it just goes through these basic steps of observe, reflect, and question. That observation is that visible evidence. What do you see? Which we started out doing with Kate. 
And then that reflection, which is something that we do automatically, students do it, we do it without even thinking about it. When we see something, we think to ourselves, how do we know, what, do we know what that is? How do we know it? What do we already know about? That's that reflection. But we want students thinking about their thinking in this process. You could have them write down questions. We've already done that here. So what I like to do, instead of having a question section, we have observe, reflect, write, or observe, reflect, list, where they might list what's going on in the image or write down what they think is going on in the image. If you use this with your students a couple of times, they will eventually, they will get it and they will be able to do it immediately and it will become automatic the more you practice it with them. Go ahead, next slide. All right, so corroborating evidence. This is so important. This is why we use primary source sets, at least one of the reasons. The strongest evidence out there to answer our priority questions is supported by more than one source. We know that is true with just about anything that we do. Um, so here we have two different images, one of Mary Johnson and one of Annie Easley. But we see there are some similarities. The producer of both photographs is NASA. In both photographs, both women are standing next to giant computers. Both women have clipboards in their hands collecting data. So this is corroboration. So this is supporting the, the ideas that students are already getting from primary source analysis. They see the evidence in one image, they see it in another image, that makes it a strong piece of evidence, something that they can use to answer their question and feel confident about their answer. We'll go to the next slide. Primary source sets are really just a, a set of sources, anywhere from three to five. It can be more, um, but in, and I will suggest or just say that if you've not used primary sources in the classroom before, um, definitely start with one. <laughs> it's always, you know, just start out with one and then add one and add another over time. But the reason that why primary source sets are so important is because it offers us those multiple points of view. We want to move away from a single narrative story where we're just looking at one point of view in history. We want to be able to see the big picture, not just the perspective of one person or one group of people. Um, so here you can see we have multiple primary sources. Um, and that by looking at this, we can automatically start to, again, corroborate some of the ideas that have already started to come up. Um, that these women work for NASA, um, that they are um, involved in the space program or engineering. One source up here also gives us an idea of how things might have been different for these women. If you see the top left-hand corner of the Armstrong College engineering class from 1946, that this engineering class is filled with men, and not just men, but white men. So it could offer students a bigger picture outside of just what these women were doing, but what potentially life was like for them and, and that it's poten potentially a challenge for them to get to where they are. I even included a, a primary source from 1992, which is technically outside of the civil rights movement, but I thought it was important to show for, stu for students to see that the, what the impact, we know, many of you notice that these women are looking up in that illustration. Um, what is it that they're looking at? What is it that they're admiring? What is it that they're proud of? And we see that kind of culmination here in this image of Mae Jemison in 1992, preparing for her space flight. We'll go to the next slide. So finally, if you get to the point, you've done your primary source analysis and you've answered your priority questions, um, but maybe you haven't gotten the full answers, or maybe you need more information. This is where you can bring in your secondary sources. Secondary sources are things that were created after the fact. So textbooks are a great example of a secondary source. So if students have, whether they've answered their priority questions or not, but now they may be even more curious about this subject and want to learn more. So you want to bring in those secondary sources. A great example here is the hidden figures the true story of the four black women in the space race, which is where this illustration comes from. What a great way to kind of bring this full circle and have students read this book or read this book in class. If you don't have access to this book through your library, there are of course plenty of resources online. I have, for example, here um, a video from the PBS NewsHour and then also a blog from the uh, Library of Congress that talks about both these topics. 
Um, so this is just taking that step further, that research step that students will be able to, you know, primary source exploration is important, but we also want to have it backed up with secondary sources. So really quickly, I just want to give you an idea. Um, we looked at several other images. Uh, Kate showed us several other illustrations. And so I wanted to give you an idea of what primary sources you could utilize to help go beyond just what you see in this, this illustration. So for example, with Ruby Bridges. Um, so we here we see she is dressed, ready for school. Clearly she is looking up and she is praying. Um, and she's got these two figures kind of looming over her, shadowing uh, over her in the back. So we go to the next slide. If you were to bring uh, primary sources, it would be about, it could be about school desegregation. And right here in the top left-hand corner, bam, you have um, the, almost that illustration come to life. This photograph of Ruby Bridges entering the school building being followed by these kind of shadowy figures, faceless figures, um, who kind of don't seem to fit together. Below here we have examples of uh, classrooms before integration. These are taken in 1948 and 1946, kind of respectively. I mean, you can start to see what, um, why, inter why segregated classrooms, um, what kind of problems came out of segregated classrooms, um, which you can see that there's kind of overcrowding in the St. Benedict Benedict's School where students are sharing desks. And then on the right-hand side, um, it is much more open and there are much less students. On the top, we see some examples of integration, um, the classroom with the girls, but also we see students who've been bused over um, to their new school and they're having to pass by parents who are protesting. We'll go to the next slide. So again, same thing, I wanted to give you an idea of what primary sources you could utilize um, with this particular illustration of Coretta Scott King. Um, so here you might bring up, of course, any primary source with Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King Jr. to give students that um, connection if they don't already make it. Um, down below, I've also brought in other women who are notable from the, the civil rights movement, including Rosa Parks and Shirley Chisholm, who is a congresswoman. Coretta Scott King up here on the right, not only involved in the civil rights movement, but here we see her at the, the march for the moratorium to end the Vietnam War, which tells us that the civil rights movement transcends what's going on at home and really kind of goes on, goes past what's going on at home and um, onto what's going on abroad as well. Um, I also wanted to think that we don't only have to focus on women that are notable or that might be recognizable from the movement. Here in the top middle, we have um, a great image of Ethel Heyer, who is from Rome, Georgia, and she was the president of the NAACP chapter in Rome for many years. And at Georgia Historical Society, we have her entire, we have her papers and her collection in our digital image catalog available online. And so really could bring this home for students that it's not just women or people outside of Georgia, but that this is going on in their home as well. And then down below on the bottom left hand corner, women from the Savannah Model Cities Program for Progress in the Academy of Black Culture, illustrating that the civil rights movement um, was, of course, about uh, equal rights under the law. But it, women who worked in the movement were also working for things like access to health care and to better education and to housing, voter registration and voter education as well. So it's not just fighting for equal rights, but so much more within their communities. So that's pretty much what I have to talk about today. I wanted to give a note that all the primary sources that I found that I brought to you today are found in these databases, the Georgia Historical Society Digital Image Catalog, which can be found at georgiahistory.com under the research tab, the Library of Congress, which is loc.gov, and the National Archives under um, uh, with Docs Teach, which is a great uh, resource if you're not familiar with it. I know that Kate had some additional resources as well. Kate, did you want to speak on any of these? Yeah, um, so I just included the, there's a teacher resource kit that includes videos, content, uh, lesson plans made by teachers for teachers at high.org forward slash PDT, um, picture the dream. 
um, but then also links to visual thinking strategies as well as artful thinking routines, um, both of which, especially artful thinking routines, was developed by Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Um, so these are resources that we use at the museum and I think dovetail really nicely into what you were talking about, Lisa. Yes, and these are strategies that, that, I, is, that we use as well and are definitely very useful. Um, I just wanted to give a quick note that the Georgia Historical Society is, um, has their Georgia History, we have our Search of History Festival ongoing right now, and that is our major K-12 programming, and it's where we provide new resources based on a particular focus of study related to Georgia and American history. And this starts in September with the beginning of a new school year, and it culminates in February because that is the founding month of the Georgia colony. This year's focus of study is uh, Tear Down This Wall, Georgia and the Cold War, where we're looking at what's going on in Georgia and in the United States during the Cold War time period. And that includes the Civil Rights Movement as it is going on during the Cold War. I also included some upcoming events that we will be having um, on the next slide. In particular, I wanted to, to share with you on the left-hand side, side of this slide, the Georgia Day Parade Banner Competition, which is something that we've done for many years, um, but we are actually going to be going virtual. So this is something that we do with social studies classes, but also with art classes. Um, and so we will be having more information come on this and we will have a webinar about how you can participate coming up in January. The theme this year is Georgia on the world stage, leadership in the late 20th century, where we'll be looking at people like Jimmy Carter, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Richard Russell, and John Lewis, among others. And if you are interested in getting this information, you're of course welcome to email me or contact me, but you can also sign up for our education newsletter um, on at georgiahistory.com uh, backslash for educators. We also have some virtual public programs, which are really more adult fit centered. If you're interested in the Cold War, we would love to have you um, attend. And these are webinars and they are free. All of this is free to the public. Um, Cold War and the Civil Rights Movement, where Kevin Gaines, UVA professor will be talking about um, the civil rights movement during the Cold War. And then Grace Elizabeth Hale, uh, UVA professor, will be talking about Cold War and popular culture in December. Okay, so I saw we had a few questions or maybe come through, but if we are kind of up at our time, okay, but I'm happy to just hang around and talk, uh, answer some questions with whoever may have some. Yeah, I really love how just one work of art has then sparked a whole, I mean, it could be a whole unit um, based on what you shared with us. So I, I really appreciate how um, that worked out like that, just from one image. And that's kind of the goal that we try to do at the High Museum when we work with teachers is how do you um, start a conversation and you can go in so many different directions with just one work of art. Um, so yeah, we. Uh, like Lisa said, we are up against time, but we're happy to answer any questions or thoughts that anybody has. Someone asked if this will be recorded, and yes, we have been recording, and we will make it available. I know GHS will make it on our YouTube page, and I'm sure the High Museum will do the same. Um, someone did ask about the parade, which I will be happy to respond to. Um, we don't, we don't actually um, have word on what will be happening specifically with that yet, but we will, of course, let you know as soon as we know. It is really up to um, uh, we have to deal with the city um, as well. Um, I said, uh, was there a suggested reading book list on women in the civil rights? Um, I don't have one in particular, but um, you're welcome to contact me and I would be happy to share some with you, but certainly there are many, 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 many options out there. Will there be more of these sessions? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes, hope, hopefully Kate and I have really enjoyed working together. We think that this history and art is a natural, uh, something that just goes together so well in the classroom. Um, so yes, I would say yes, watch out for more. If, and again, if you want to stay up to date, I know that we share things through our education newsletter. I'm sure Kate, you have something as well. Yeah, we have a educator news um, blast that goes out. After this session, we can send out resources and places for you to sign up but we were talking about sessions that we want to do in the spring. So be on the lookout. Oh, well, I'm just so glad to see all this good feedback. Oh, no, I'm 
So those are our email addresses at the bottom. If you want to contact us at any time, um, we're happy to answer questions and talk more. You're welcome, everybody. This was a great opportunity and thank you so much. We really had a lot of interest in this program and it is, um, I'm so glad that it's been well received and um, that you've taken some things that you will take back with you to your classroom. Yeah, thank you everyone. We really enjoyed working with you today. It's so important in, in getting students to talk <laughs> and engage in conversations and think about what do they care about and what what are they curious about and how can you tap into that curiosity to help them learn yes there will this will be uh, provided as a recording it may be a few days i know that takes some time for the recording to render Sorry for being late. Oh, you're fine. Whoever said that. <laughs> I forgot about the time, you know. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good question. Yes, we will send a follow-up um, document with all the links that we've mentioned today, um, access to the resources that we've mentioned, and the recording. Uh, so we will send that to the participants. If you are registered, you will be uh, provided that information. Okay. And how often we will be having this? We hope to do more in the future. I am um, currently about eight months pregnant, so I'm about to go on maternity leave. But as soon um, as I get back, Lisa and I talked about doing more sessions. Hmm, okay. The more to come. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm looking forward to listening to the to the recording to know what you talked about and put my feedback back to you. <laughs> yes, we would love feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any more lingering questions, Lisa? My um, I think we're just getting a lot of thank yous and um, so yeah, I mean, we're pretty much done unless anybody has any questions, um, please let us know. Again, as Kate said, our emails, they're there. You're welcome to um, send an email, contact us, check out both websites. <laughs> yeah. Lots of resources available, I know on both. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end us. So thank you all for joining and we look forward to seeing you the next time. Good luck this year. Thanks very much for organizing this. Thanks everybody. You're welcome. You're welcome.